making a video to tell people the best reasons that they should vote for UKIP in the general election 2015. Now, I know that UKIP are unpopular on various topics. It seems like it's trendy. It's trendy to not like UKIP. Their kind of trendy dislike of UKIP is actually that they're just responding to information that they get inundated with from the media and from their peer groups. I'm going to show people this video in the hope that it might help you but you can get a few extra votes because I feel that we're in a, a very precarious time in, on the planet politically and I think if we keep on going towards the destination that the governments and the current elites and status quo want us to go towards then we'll end up at the end of it maybe even as close as the next kind of five to seven years we will we will end up with a, a completely changed world a completely changed political system and the system will be remade and it will be remade in favour of people who are already the status quo and it will be made more in their favour so I think unless we vote in an unpopular party with unpopular ideas and policies then it could be the end for, for freedom and democracy as we know it and that could happen during my lifetime so I just want people to know that and I know that UKIP have got a bad reputation for things that they say and things that they have said and I'm going to talk about that as well I'm not going to shirk away from it I'm going to talk about that as well but um tradition I mean listen I, I'm Scottish so I'm not one of UKIP's core voters U, UKIP don't uh, try and appeal to me in their core vote. Nigel Farage himself has said that over Hadrian's Wall he he doesn't really expect it to get much votes even although um, UKIP do have one Euro MEP and that's David Coburn and David Coburn himself has said that he feels that the uh, Scottish people are they don't go about boasting that they're, they're UKIP voters, but there is a percentage of a certain percentage of UKIP voters in Scotland, and their popularity is growing. My family, their traditional leaning left family, um, they probably, I mean, they at least have respect for. I think when I talk about things, because I've talked about things which are so alien to them over a, a kind of long period of time, they've got to the point where they really just don't care and, and they're quite open to hearing all different kinds of views and all different kinds of people's opinions and having discussions about it and that is that is the essence of free speech, so fair play to them. They might not come round to what I'm talking about, but it doesn't matter, I'm still going to try. I want people to know, black and Asian people to know that uh, I'm not a racist at all, uh, I'm very very open to different types of peoples and I'm open to learning about new cultures, I'm very interested in that. Um, I've liked black comics, I've liked black literature, I've always liked black music, I've been influenced by these things throughout the growing up when I was an adolescent and they say that when you're an adolescent the thing like the music that they listen to the things that you were into when you were an adolescent they stay with you that there has been some kind of scientific study that's been done on that and they've said that when you're an adolescent the things that you listen to and you're interested in they stay with you for the rest of your life and it remains very powerful to you and quite a lot of the things that I was interested in during that time period was black as I say black literature black culture black comedy and like music so I'm not a racist at all and I wouldn't try and lead anyone I wouldn't try and I'm traditionally left myself but I wouldn't try and lead anyone down the wrong path so I'm Scottish I've got nothing to gain from liking UKIP UKIP say that they want to cut down the Barnet formula that seems fair to me as long as the negotiations are fair I'm quite happy to go with it because I think that the benefits that we'll get from having UKIP in power will far far outweigh um, anything that can currently be gained from maintaining the Barnet formula so as I say I'm traditionally left I'm from a group in society that really has no reason or no motivation to like UKIP but I'm going to explain to you why everyone 
should like UKIP, including traditionally leaning left people, including black and Asian people. So let's go on with it. The first thing we're talking about is the economy. Right, this is the most detailed breakdown I could find of about UK exports. I'll put the link in the bottom of the video when I make the video so you can have a look into it yourself. So it's in the top five products that we export, that we sell to other people is cars, refined petroleum, crude petroleum, packaged medication and gas turbines. And the top five things that we import is crude petroleum, cars, refined petroleum, packaged medical instruments and computers. What I'm trying to do here is dissipate the fears that surround what would happen if we left the EU, What because the main parties constantly talk about if we left the EU it would be disastrous for the economy, so what we're really talking about there is exports and imports, that's the only thing that can actually gain an economy money is what do they sell and what do they buy. If we are selling much more than we buy from other people then we're going to be making profit. It's as simple as that, so what do we export? This is where it becomes very strange because I've came to the exact detailed breakdown of it and we're seeing that we export cars. Now, we're also 7% of what we export is refined petroleum but we're also importing that so and 6% of what we sell is crude petroleum and we also import that so there again if we're selling oil to EU countries then there's already a negotiating standpoint there where we wouldn't have to sell our refined petroleum or our crude petroleum. I mean, the numbers are almost exactly the same. We could actually just not sell it and keep it for ourselves and use it for ourselves because at the moment we're currently exporting it and importing it. So, there we go. We're already seeing that there's a negotiation point there. There's a... seems strange. Now again, packaged medication, we are exporting packaged medication and we're also importing it, so I suppose that's a bit more detailed. Refined petroleum and refined oil and crude oil are not, there's absolutely no difference. These things are exactly the same, there's no way that they could be any different. Packaged medication, yeah, that could be a little bit different, but we're already seeing, you know, maybe we could produce this stuff for ourselves, we don't necessarily, if the, if it was so bad for us to leave the EU, well, we're already seeing that the largest things that we sell are also some of the largest things that we buy, so we could already offset if we had a, 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 a kind of years, like maybe one to three years where people in the EU weren't interested in buying our things. As a, as a form of punishment for leaving the EU, we've already seen that the largest things that we actually sell, we wouldn't need, perhaps wouldn't need to sell them. Even if the EU wanted to put some form of punishment on us and not trade with us for a couple of years, then we could actually offset our own losses, because largely what we're selling is the same as what we're buying, and we could either sell our oil to someone else, or we could keep on producing it and use it for ourselves rather than buying it in and that's all we would need to do so where are we selling our products to? the top five destinations is America 12% Germany, 11% Holland basically 8% France at 7 and Belgium at 5.5 so those are EU countries so that's looking quite bad at the moment where do we import from? we import from Germany roughly the same China, Holland, America and France. So that's less bad because we've got one, two, two of the top five countries are non-EU countries. I wanted to show you something. On a negotiation point, right, what we sell to Germany and what we buy from Germany is almost exactly the same, 11% and 13%, so even if we did leave the EU, there's clearly negotiating room there. I mean, Germany aren't going to want to give up 10% of UK exports, and they're not going to want to give up 13% of the imports that they sell to us. 
So we sell 11% of our stuff to them and they sell 13% of their stuff to us. So there's clearly a negotiating room there. Even if we left the EU, Germany's not going to want to lose that that amount of money and the UK is not going to want to lose that amount of money. So whether we're in the EU or not, there's a negotiating room there. Holland and Holland again, it's almost exactly the same. What we sell to them is 7.6% of our economy and what they sell to us is 7.5% of our economy. So again, there's absolutely perfect negotiating room there. Even if we left the EU, they're still going to be interested in negotiating those deals with us because everyone is desperate to make money in this the type of economy that they have this now, this basically failing economy. France, we sell 6.9% of our stuff to France and we buy 5.7% of our stuff from France. So again, they're absolutely perfect negotiating room there. So we've got, even though we might leave the EU, we've got perfect negotiation uh, room with Germany, Holland and France because we basically are buying just as much stuff from them as we are selling to them and neither country is going to want to lose out on that. Okay, so I'll take you down to a more detailed breakdown here on this. Uh, this is the best website that I could find. I'm going to change it to continent and it's saying that 56% of our exports go to Europe, 20% go to Asia, 15% go to America. Now, they are including Europe as a continent, they are not including it as the EU trading bloc, there's only 27 countries in the EU. Now, Russia is not in the EU, Switzerland is not in the EU, Norway is not in the EU, so I've went through this entire list of countries that are not actually in the EU, and I'll tell you, um, and I've put down the monetary numbers that, that we sell to them and the percentage points that they have put. Macedonia is not in the EU. Gibraltar is not in the EU, Estonia is not in the EU, Russia is not in the EU, Switzerland's not, Norway's not, Serbia's not, Bosnia and Herzegovina is not, Iceland's not, Belarus is not, Moldova's not, Albania's not, Montenegro's not, the Vatican is not, and San Marino is not. Now, it was pretty small percentage points that we were talking about. It came to five point. All those countries added together came to five point three five percent. Um. The Vatican and where are they? San Marino. The Vatican and San Marino amounted to zero percent. But just to give you a real rough idea of what I'm talking about, zero percent. The Vatican didn't register anything, but we still send sell them two point three five million pounds of things, and San Marino is at zero percent as well, and we still sell them five point five million pounds of export goods, right? So we can see it's it's quite high numbers. Russia, Russia was the highest number. So what? It basically, two percent amounted amounts to eight point one six billion dollars. So it's not jump change that we're talking about here. Even though it's low percentage points, it's actually a lot of money that we're talking about. So I'll switch it to continent. And I'll show you 56%. And if I take away the 5.35, then we're talking just over 50% of our the goods that we are selling is going to the EU. So that sounds pretty bad, but when it comes to Germany, France, and Holland, there's definitely negotiating room there because we're selling them basically just as much stuff as we buy. This I've wrote down a list of negotiables because Ireland, right? Ireland would be negotiable because. I know there was that story not so long ago, maybe about 2012-2011 um, where the UK basically paid in a lot more money than other EU trading bloc members to bail out Ireland when Ireland needed its bailout because our economies, the UK and the Irish economies are so intertwined that they basically need each other so there's negotiating room there with Ireland. Even if we come out of the EU on a gentleman's agreement, Ireland are not going to be one to completely get rid of the UK as a trading partner because they need the money basically. So even although it seems like a large number, the 50%, Ireland, Germany, Gibraltar, France, Holland and Malta are all good friends of ours. 
especially Malta and Gibraltar are good friends of ours. And Ireland, Germany, France and Holland as I've already shown you there then Germany's not going to want to lose ten percent of their income because the UK's not in the EU anymore. Ireland's not going to want to lose what does Ireland uh, buy from us? Ireland's not going to want to lose 4%, 19 billion pounds coming in from the UK. Ireland's not going to want to lose that money because all these countries are, are desperate for money at this at this moment in time and so is the UK. So if the UK decided to come out of the EU, at the end of the day, these countries are still going to want to make deals with the UK because it's money, money talks. And we've got some perfect, absolutely perfect negotiating points between a lot of these countries because we're basically buying just as much stuff from them as we are selling to them. What actually really matters more is growth. Who are you making net profit from? And where is your growth coming from? That's actually what matters in the real world and in the real business world at this moment in time. And this is gross. See the the amounts that I'm showing you and I'm showing you that there's negotiating points that they won't want to lose the money the same way that we won't want to lose the money whether we're in the EU or not let me take you to net growth this is how much profit that Britain makes and there we go I'll take it down to a continent we're making 45% of our profit from Asia we're making 25% of our profit from America we're only making 11% of profit from Europe so this EU trading block thing, it's actually its a bit of a misnomer. We're basically selling them just as much stuff as we're buying from them on a kind of gentleman's agreement and it's not really, the UK economy's not really making that much money from it. And I'll show you the growth value for the past five years by country. And all of the top countries are basically Asian countries and in America, Canada, the CONCAF. So the top countries that we actually make profit from is Asian countries, American countries. We're not really making that much profit from Europe and our growth values are way down. So we're not actually... The growth values in Asia are way up. The growth values for North American CONCAF countries are way up but not so much Europe. If I put it to country as well, right, to show you the exact breakdown of where our growth is coming from in Europe, where we're actually making net profit from, Ireland. Ireland, we have a gen we basically have a gentleman's agreement with Ireland. They are not going to be that. In they are still going to be interested in selling and buying goods from us because even whether we're in the, the EU or not, Gibraltar, they are. One of our greatest friends in the whole, they're a, a principality that of of the UK. I don't know what the correct word is. Macedonia is not in the EU. The UK are only just into the EU, but they're basically a failing state and they're at war, having to take IMF loans. Greece, or we've got good growth in Greece. Greece might not be in the, in Europe in the next few years. Estonia is not in the EU. Malta are in the EU, but they're one of our best friends. They were in the Commonwealth until the 70s. Serbia's not in the EU, Albania's not in the EU, Andorra's not in the EU, the Vatican's not in the EU, Bulgaria is, Montenegro's not, Bosnia and Herzegovina's not. So of the growth, the actual net profit countries that we are making from Europe, this uh, 10%, 12% net profit that we make from from Europe, the actual growth that we are making the money is not from EU countries and the, the biggest country where we've had growth, Ireland, they're either not EU countries or they are one of our best friends over, over the course of, of history. Okay, so it's only in recent history that the UK and Ireland have, have made good friends, but they are good friends now and their economies are extremely intertwined so we really have nothing to lose from coming out of the EU. It's all bluff and bluster when they say, you know, how much jobs we will lose, how much money we will lose. Basically, any net profit that we're making, 
when we're selling goods is coming from Asia and America, that's where all our growth is in any countries that we're selling to that are actually in the EU, it's basically a standoff, we're selling them as much as we're buying from them, they're not going to want to lose that and we're not going to want to lose that, so even if we're in the EU or we're not in the EU, all of our growth is actually coming from non-EU countries or countries which we have gentlemen's agreements with, we hold big large negotiations with, with them, so we've really got nothing to lose from coming out of the EU. Now this isn't just about the EU, this is about the economy, why you you keep it the best for the economy. So a monetary policy committee member for the Bank of England is saying that UK exports to the EU are dead in the war and that's the end of last year. He's saying that if we do have an economic recovery it's unlikely to be export driven because our biggest trading partner is dead in the water. That's what he says. So that's he's backing up the information that I just found. There's no growth to be found in the EU all our growth of our goods that we're selling and that's how you get out of a recession you need to sell more than you buy that's it that's how simple it is um, again May last year a UK um, report a Civitas a think tank there have decided that there's no benefit from the UK being in the, in the there's no trade benefit for the UK being in the EU has not given the UK any inside advantages in trade with other European countries. A report by social policy think tank Civitas says it says trade with fellow EU nations makes up no more of the UK's trade with all top economies now than it did when we first joined in 1973. So they've basically looked at the figures and they're finding that whatever business we were doing with Europe in 1973, it's just basically the same as what we're doing now. There hasn't been any growth, it's just always been the same, so they're not going to want to lose that and we're not going to want to lose that, whether we're in, in the EU or not. Now, Civitas have done a report which says that, to be honest with you, actually, it's impeding our economic growth, the EU. It's saying the cost of EU regulation is estimated that costs us £20 billion a year, that their environment and energy rules fail in their objectives by forcing production out of Europe to unregulated regions and it costs us £25 million and possibly £3 billion to the country for these green regulations. So what they're basically saying is that when you pass green regulations all that big companies do is they just shut down whatever factories and that they've got of producing their energies and things in in the western world they just shut them down, they take them to the east, China and India, if they have say green targets on emissions or if they have to pay green taxes they just move their business, they just shut down their businesses here so that costs jobs in this country and then they take it elsewhere, they pay people next to nothing in Asia and China, they slave labour wages and they don't actually have to abide by any green laws in Asia either. Now Asia is much more competitive so they're they're doing better because they're be, they're taking that business up and we're losing that business, we're losing those jobs. Asia are taking them up, they're becoming more competitive and it's not actually helping the environment whatsoever because the same amount of harmful emissions, so-called harmful emissions, is still going into the Earth's atmosphere because all that big businesses do is just shut down their factories in this country and then move them away to places where they can get cheaper wa cheaper wages, cheaper labour and they don't have to abide by any green rules so it doesn't, it actually is not affecting the environment whatsoever in, in a positive way. Okay, it's saying that the common fisheries policy has decimated fish stops and it's driven up supermarket prices, minimised employment and may have cost the UK up to £5 billion pounds a year. And the reforms are inadequate, they're not even really helping. The common agricultural policy has drained £10 billion pounds a year in direct costs and inflated food prices. The UK contributes between £6 billion and £15 billion net to the annual EU budget. 
EQ, EU procurement and state aid rules restrict the government's ability to award public works contracts to top UK firms, to prop up job creating firms and to revitalise the economy. And they're saying it's all compounded by the restrictive nature of the customs union. The EU negotiates external trade deals painfully slowly as a collective which impedes international commerce and restricts, restricts profits. So that means the EU are actually negotiating some of our trade deals on our behalf. We are giving them that power. We are not even negotiating a lot of our deals on our own. Okay, so I'll take you down to the laws and regulations part. EU regulation cost the country 19 billion in 2009. And even pro European politicians have estimated EU regulation costs at similar levels. Lord Mandelson suggests it costs us 4% in 2004. 4% of our GDP, these EU regulations that we're having a um, administer the costs of that, put them through, abide by them. The Dutch minister gave the same 4% figure and a German in 2006, the European Commissioner for Industry and Enterprise stated that the average cost for member states was 5.5% of GDP, which he revised down to 3.5%. So even he ad is admitting, the European Commissioner for Industry and Enterprise is admitting that it actually cost you quite a lot of money. It cost you 3.5% of your, at the most conservative estimate, 3.5% of your GDP to uh, to administer the EU's regulations, environment and energy rules. As we're saying, it doesn't actually benefit the, the environment to abide by these rules. Big business are going to find ways to get around it and that's just the simple facts of it. If we aren't, given, if we aren't doing this business, China's going to do this business, Asia's going to do this business, Africa's going to do this business, the Caribbean's going to do this business, anyone who sees a space in the market where they can do this business, they will do it because they need the money, they need the jobs. Here it is there. The Centre for European Reform, a broadly pro-EU think tank, is similarly critical. Stephen Tyndale shows that UK-EU environmental regulation simply drives dirty industries to unregulated countries where their impact is usually worse than it would have been if left alone, so it's not even helping the environment and it's costing us money. Thus the regulation fails its own green targets and threatens domestic growth. So they're actually threatening our growth, making us uh, abide by these green rules. The common fisheries policy. It holds back the economy in numerous ways. It promotes overfishing. It allows nations to fish UK waters. It, that artificially increases the fish prices and wastes tons of viable stock through quota imposed dumping. In their study of the fishery policy, fisheries policy, Greenpeace alleged that 70% of fish stocks are currently overfished, while the BBC puts it at 75%. The New Economics Foundation NEF, a broadly left-leaning think tank, argues that the CFP has devastated the seas so profoundly that only a virtual suspension of fishing for four to ten years will replenish the stocks. So, the common fisheries policy has led to overfishing, and they've now got new regulations about dumping quota imposed dumping, it's not stopping people from actually fishing the fish, it just means they're still fishing the fish, but then they're not actually even selling those fish and letting people eat them. What they're doing is they're still fishing the fish, but then they're just dumping large percentages of it because they've been told they can only fish a certain amount, but these fish are probably not, probably going back into the sea dead. It's not helped the environment whatsoever. Um, the Taxpayers Alliance, Dr. Lee Rotherham, a Taxpayers Alliance economist, argues that the loss of access to home waters under the 200 nautical mile principle cost the UK £2.1 billion pounds per year, um, arrived at an annual cost of £2.8 billion. This claim appears to be corroborated as the Fishermen's Association estimate that the CFP, the Common Fisheries Policy, costs Scotland alone £706 million annually. So the Common Fisheries is that 
France can come here and fish our fish, blah blah blah, everybody can come here and fish our fish. Whereas before we had the 200 nautical mile principle and only our, so that's driven our fishermen out of business. So, there's, they've brought out these reforms and it includes new measures to halt dumping but there is no agreement on reform to total allowable catches. So that means you can catch as much as you want but you've then got to dump it if it's over their quotas. Um, the world's largest marine environmental group, Oceana, worries the plan didn't establish any mechanisms to deal with landed bycatch, so even under the common fisheries policy it's not helping the environment, we're overfishing the fish. The common agricultural policy, Institute of Economic Affairs argues that food prices are on average 17% higher than they would be otherwise. Agricultural prices were inflated by 3.7 billion in 2008. Um, direct costs. It's saying although that we do receive some money from the EU, by far we are a net contributor, and even the money that we do send, it's not effectively spent. We're having to adhere to state aid under the EU rules. We could stop that. That's costing us money. With Welsh pro-European lobby often trumpets the value of the EU's economic clout and Britain's extra weight within it, the benefit is severely limited. As a member state, Britain must maintain the common external tariff and cannot negotiate bilateral trade agreements with third parties. It can only participate in EU bilateral negotiations. Prospective EU trade pa partners face not only the carrot of free access to the single market, but the stick of needing to undergo, pr undergo protracted negotiations with 27 different nations and authority, entailing numerous pockets of protectionism. If the EU was truly an unambiguous champion of free trade, we might ask why are they not already free trade agreements with America, China and India? They're saying if free trade is, is so so great then why aren't America and why don't America and China have one amongst each other? Why don't America, China and India have one amongst each other? Because China's creating all these goods at cheap prices, America's buying all the goods. And they don't need a free trade agreement, they can do it anyway. And the Euro us, Britain, Europe, they are also trading with America and China and Russia and we don't need a free trade agreement to do it, we just do it. In fact, the EU is too large, divided and unwieldy to close deals with the most important markets. It's actually holding us back. So we're seeing there that they're doing a lot of the, these negotiations on our behalf. We're not even negotiating our own deals and the British are known for being charming people. Culturally, um, Right now, America probably has the biggest cultural impact because they've got Hollywood and so people are interested in American celebrities, American culture, American movies and that's mostly through the Hollywood impact. Now, before that, Britain was probably culturally the most important nation on earth. People are interested in the kind of British stereotypes, the English man with the bowler hat and the and the cane and, and the striped suit and the Scottish man that likes his whiskey and with a harsh accent, the ginger hair and, the, and where's the kilt. Culturally, Britain has a massive impact on the world. We're known for having charm, we're known for having humour, we're known for eccentrism, we're known for being unique, we're known for all these different things but we can't even put across our charm, our personalities when we're making these deals. The EU is doing that for us. No offence to Belgium or Luxembourg or, or Holland but clearly those countries have not made even an iota of the cultural impact that Britain has made throughout the world. If Scotland was going to sell whiskey to Japan, then Japanese people would want to come here, they would want to see people dressed in kilts, they would want to see ginger people, they would want to have a laugh about it, and I'm sure that we would have a laugh about it. We would take them and we would show them Stirling, we would show them things to do with William Wallace and parts of our history that's very charming and very unique and you can lose yourself in it just purely based on the interest of it and then we would show them the whiskey and the barrels of the whiskey and how old it is and how traditional it is. Is that happening? Are, are Belgish, Belgian people who are negotiating on our behalf, are they able to do things like that and put 
put across the charm, the humour that British people have to make deals, the cultural impact that we have had in the world. The EU hasn't had an iota of the cultural impact that, that Britain has had on the world, so why are we outsourcing or negotiating to the EU? We can do that for ourselves, and the truth is we could probably do it many multiples of times better than they can. And it's saying the, supp the supposition that the United Kingdom with a GDP of 2.3 trillion and are a member of the UN Security Council, the third largest economy on the European continent and the eighth largest in the world, would somehow lose its ability to form meaningful trade relationships is fanciful. So they're saying, oh, just because we're in the EU, we wouldn't be able to negotiate these deals and things like that is just ridiculous. So we're seeing there a lot of reasons to say that the EU is actually impeding our growth. They're, they're holding us back, if anything. What's worth considering is the Commonwealth. Um, the Commonwealth is actually bigger than the EU. Um, it's got two billion people in it. And I think that when it comes to the Commonwealth and Ireland, for example, the relationships that Britain has with people in the Commonwealth and in Ireland, these relationships are paid for in blood. Um, it doesn't really matter now in the present day who was at fault. It, it was Britain who was at fault going around doing, doing the colonisation of the world, but that's in the past now and we have built established relationships with these countries since colonisation for better or worse they've stuck together and, and it, is a, it is a developed relationship we've got lots of immigrants from Ireland we've had lots of immigrants from the Caribbean and Africa we've got established relationships with these people and these relationships are paid for in blood so I think it's actually dishonourable what we're doing, we're moving disregarding our relationships in the, the British Commonwealth and we starting up with the EU who aren't even beneficial they've got less people, they've got less growth and as I say, these relationships within, that we have in the Commonwealth are actually paid for in blood and as I say, it's kind of, it, it does matter who was wrong but it's inconsequential now going forward and in the present day, who is at fault for what because we're not at war anymore, we're not doing anything nasty to each other but I think that we do have to honour the fact that We've had established relationships with these people over countless years and at a time when things are starting to get good for both parties concerned, less so for Britain, um, you know, we're ditching them and we want to move on to the EU, I think that's wrong because, you know, we went to these people's countries, we stole their resources, we took them on as slaves and slave labour. We established our country when we were taking their resources and uh, treating their, their people unkindly during that time. I'm sure it wasn't all bad and it wasn't all, you know, completely some of the stories that we that we might hear might be a little bit exaggerated, you know. Um but all I'm saying is that these relationships are paid for in blood and I think that we have a duty as British people, as as a British country to keep keep establishing a relationship with the Commonwealth because, you know, we love each other now and that's the way it should be. And this woman here, she's um, an economics advisor. I think she's an owner of a a, a banking group. Uh, she knows her stuff. And she's saying that the latest IMF forecasts show that the major Commonwealth countries have healthy growth prospects in the medium term significantly better than for major EU countries. And looking to the longer term, they are blessed with favourable demographics. So they're saying their population's going to get much bigger. 
which she's saying, my, enth my enthusiasm for the Commonwealth has nothing to do with a romantic attachment to a fading dream of imperial glory. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Commonwealth countries do not have their best years behind them, as I fear many EU countries do. They have their best years ahead of them. And she says it's mistaken and old-fashioned to regard the Commonwealth as the past. And I, I agree with her there. We've got an... Uh, we've got, an, got to honour our relationship with these people. These countries. Um, and their business costs, their business rates are lower, so... Their population's booming, their economic forecasts are better, their costs are lower. So, they are the future. The Commonwealth is the future, not the EU. And we already have established relationships with the Commonwealth, so I don't know why we would dishonour that relationship and try and move on to the EU. Now let's get more into the actual economics, the day-to-day -day economics of Britain what is currently happening in, in Britain rather than in relationship to the EU. Right. Now, this is very, very important. This Britain um, was responsible for the invention of... British scientists at Manchester University were responsible for the discovery of this new wonder material, graphene. And George Osborne at the time was going around putting it in his um, budgets, his, f his budgets saying that it was going to, this was going to be the super thing that was going to um, bring Britain out of the recession, basically this is going to be something that we are going to export, remember when I was saying about the export and all you have to do is sell more than you buy, so this is the thing that was going to bring Britain out of the recession, according to George Osborne, he was going about saying that in his budgets. He has pinned his econ his hopes of economic recovery on it. He mentioned graphene in the bulk of his autumn statements and budgets and visited the lab twice in the last few months to handle the black stuff himself. So he was doing kind of media drives based on it and he was putting it in his budget saying this was graphene was going to be the thing that takes the UK out of the recession. Now this is a very important point because under George Osborne's watch it completely dropped the ball on graphene. How UK wonder substance graphene can't and won't benefit the UK, even though it's considered to be one of the greatest discoveries in science for the last, god knows, 30 years, something like that. Graphene is the thinnest material on earth and it's almost a million times slimmer than a strand of hair. Almost everything about graphene begs it to be inscribed in legend. The speed and scale of the action from publishing results in the 2004 to a Nobel Prize six years later, so the people who discovered this won a Nobel Prize. What actually happened since then, though, is that our record with graphene has been dismal, and consultants calculate that China has taken out more than 2,200 patents on graphene, the US has taken out more than 1,700, and South Korea 1,200, and we, the country that discovered it, the UK, has taken out just over 50 patents for the actual design of it. So I know that in a lot of ways we don't like capitalism, but in this particular instance, the UK has dropped the ball and they haven't been capitalistic enough. They haven't actually went out, thought, what can we use graphene for? Taking out patents on the things, and this would have completely saved our economy. Go again reiterating that UK appears behind in the race to develop graphene. It is a British scientific breakthrough that George Osborne hoped would play a key role in his attempts to rebalance the economy, but the UK is already trailing well behind Asia in the race to commercially develop graphene, the 20th century wonder material, sorry, 21st century. In March's budget, the Chancellor pledged further investment describing graphene as a great British discovery that we should break the habit of a lifetime with and commercially develop in Britain. So, George Osborne has been um, involved in this, he's been vocally involved in it, he's done media drives on it, he's done, he knows all about it, he's pledged that he's going to invest in it, but 
It's turned out that based on patent applications, the UK Bailey appears to be in the race to develop the material. We are not even taking out patents. We are not properly developing this thing, and, and we have had the biggest. We've had the biggest heads up on it. And George Osborne has been massively invested in this, and Britain has completely dropped the ball on it. And it's probably, probably the biggest scat, one of the biggest scandals, economic scandals in uh, UK history, alongside the financial collapse. But you won't hear about it. The media aren't reporting on it the way they should do. So the Conservatives have completely dropped the ball on this. Um, of the 11,000 patents and patent applications worldwide relating to graphene which was discovered 10 years ago in a physics lab in Manchester, the UK has filed just 101, equivalent to less than 1%. So the people who are going to be making the monies from this is Asian companies and American companies and South Korean companies. So there we go. I couldn't spell it out any clearer for you. The Conservatives are not up to the job of fixing this economy. They had the biggest chance that Britain has possibly ever had to get out of the economy. A better chance than anyone else in the world to get out of it. George Osborne was heavily invested in it, heavily involved in it. He knew everything about it and he still, under his watch, they still dropped the ball on it. Austerity. 20th of February 2015 they were asking George Osborne about the Grexit when Greece were threatening the Syriza government were threatening to come out of Europe and George Osborne said in an interview that it's a risk to Britain, we need the Eurozone to find a common solution here at home we need to go on working through our economic plan which has kept us safe so George Osborne there is referring to austerity as an economic plan now Britain's got um, nearly three trillion pounds in debt, and we're um, hundred billion, I think, in the the deficit. So we're not even touching. We're not even close to paying off the national debt. And he's he's saying that it's a, an economic plan. So let's see how well he's doing in his economic plan. Blow for George Osborne as as government borrowing rises, sending the country's debt pile to one point five trillion. So his borrowing increased by 3.7 billion in the 12 months to October, and this is from November last year, just November last year. So George Osborne's economic plan to pay off the the debt, the 1.5 trillion debt that we've not even touched and we're in the deficit, he's actually added to that deficit. So. That's his economic plan. That's what he's saying. That, you know, we need to stick to this plan. What plan? And it's went up by 150 billion in just a year. The 1.5 trillion. And debt represents 80% of the Britain's entire economic output. And he's saying, you know, that's his plan. So that's why I think that. Uh, all the other parties are going to stick to austerity, all the other parties, most of the other parties are saying that they're going to um, actually increase spending, so if you increase the spending you're going to increase the deficit um, and add to the debt, and George Osborne's already adding to the debt. So let's have a look at what people are saying, what they're going to do about the debt coming into 2015, and this is why I think UKIP is the best for Britain. Conservatives are ramming home their long-term economic plan, so I've just went through that. They haven't done that at all, they've added to the deficit. Labour are saying they're going to balance the books by cutting the deficit more slowly than the Conservatives, so... Um, and increasing taxes on people and increasing spending. If you're increasing taxes on people, they're going to have less money to put in the private economy so that means that probably businesses are going to be going under if Labour increase the taxes which is what most people are predicting and they're going to cut the deficit more slowly so the, the debt will just continue to, to add up. It went up, what was it? It went up by 150 billion in a year 
Anyway, that's how fast it's multiplying. It's exponential. It's almost unpayable. The Liberal Democrats are saying that they are going to get an additional six billion from tax rises on high value properties and six billion from tax dodgers. Well, they're not going to be able to get the six billion on tax dodgers because there's legal tax loopholes and people who are rich enough to pay accountants to look into these tax loopholes are not stupid enough to let the Lib Dems catch them out and they're not going to get if they are getting it again as the six billion more taxes on high value properties that just means people are having to give more money to the government and they're having less money in their pockets to actually spend in the shops and on the things that actually make the economy grow um, the Green Party do want to deal with the deficit they want to raise taxes so again that's taking money out of people's pockets and um, they're not going to be able to spend it in the private economy which is really what makes the economy grow the private economy makes things grow the government doesn't make anything grow so giving them more money isn't is adding to the problem it's not solving the problem and they want to increase environmental taxation so they're going to increase taxation in a whole n number of areas and they're going to bring in those environmental taxes that I've already shown you. All that happens is the big businesses then shut down, they stop operating in, in the UK, they stop operating in the West, all the jobs are lost and they just take their, they outsource their um, jobs to Asia and Africa and China and the Caribbean, wherever it might be, they'll go wherever it takes if they're getting taxed. Uh, what, if they're getting wildly taxed, unfairly taxed, that's all that will happen. So the only people who actually have a viable plan to cut down the deficit is UKIP. UKIP want to reduce the debt by leaving the European Union, which we contribute their 8 billion per annum. Net, so that's us saving 8 billion if we come out of Europe. They want to um, cut the foreign aid budget, that's definitely possible, that's a few billion a year I think, so there we're already cutting the budget, we'll be able to tap into the deficit that way, and they're going to scrap HS2, which is £9 billion, pounds. so there they're finding, you can be able to find money like that straight away, other parties are not able to do that. Um, and it's actual real tangible things that can really actually be done. The other people are talking about things that really either can't be done or they're actually going to harm people in their pockets. Um, UKIP aren't going to do that. that UKIP have, are the only party who have a viable plan that can actually get us out of the deficit. And even then it's going to be very, very hard thing to do. And I also believe that UKIP would cut down on government wastage. UKIP are talking about cutting down on administrators in the NHS, middle management in the NHS, I believe that UKIP would be the best party at cutting down government wastage. I think they're the most honest party and if they find that the government are wasting a lot of money I think that they will cut it down whereas other parties won't. The reason that the other parties won't do that is because they're attached to big lobbyists, they're attached to big business and uh, these big lobbies and big business are probably the ones who justify the government wastage. We are probably giving a lot of money to big business and big lobbyists just through government wastage and that's why they do it. They're given, that's how they, a, a backdoor way of, of giving money to their, to their business friends and you kept aren't connected to big lobbyists. They're not interested in that. So. I think from what we can see in 2015, the only people who have a, an economic plan that can actually be carried out, feasibly be carried out and actually have an effect on the deficit is UKIP. And that is the reasons that I think on the economy, UKIP are best for your vote in 2015. Thank you. Bye.